Welcome. In this lesson, we're going to be looking at sine of x and its derivative. First of all, let's have a quick discussion about what sine of x actually is. And the way it's explained to people is that it's a ratio between the opposite over the hypotenuse. So to explore that concept for a second, let's just say you built a right angled triangle. You have the opposite side, the hypotenuse, and the adjacent side. If you select an angle for that triangle, say pi on 4, or we'll say pi on 6, pi on 6, then the ratio of the opposite side to the hypotenuse will always be 1 on 2. So the opposite side will always be half the length of the hypotenuse. This is a confusing concept, especially when you start to get angles above pi on 2, which almost seems counterintuitive for a right angle triangle. So one thing I find simplifies the whole thing down. Uh, it doesn't necessarily give you the values, but it definitely gives you a clue as to what size they might be, is the unit circle, which I have drawn up uh, to the top left here, unit circle. And the beauty of this thing is that they've taken the ratio opposite over hypotenuse, which is equal to sine x, opposite over hypotenuse, and they've said in this unit circle, draw a line from the origin to any point on the unit circle, and then make it into a right angled triangle. Because this circle has a radius of one and it's centered around the origin, the hypotenuse of this triangle will always equal one. So when you go to find the ratio, sine x equals opposite over hypotenuse, it's equal to opposite over one, the opposite being the length of this side here. I'll draw a blue line parallel to it. That didn't come out very clear. There we go. So sine of x is simply equal to the height of the opposite side of the triangle. And I've drawn lines indicating that particular length. So it makes it very easy to estimate and then to work out eventually what sine of x actually is and also simplifies it when I'm graphing sine x. So we'll go down to the axis I have below and we'll have a go at graphing sine of x uh, based on this unit circle. So sine of zero is the first challenge. Sine of zero is very uh, obvious to most people but we'll do it using the unit circle method. Drawing a line in the green circle in the middle of the page to the bottom from the origin to the unit circle at an angle of zero because x is equal to zero. The opposite side of that triangle has length zero. So sine of zero is equal to zero. We'll mark that in with a little cross. Now sine pi on six Pi on 6 radians is equal, uh, looking at this formula I'm underlining in green to the top right, we have to multiply pi on 6, oops sorry, we want to go from degree, we want to go from radians to degrees, so degrees, I'll write the opposite formula, is equal to radians times 180 on pi. So if we start with uh, pi on 6 radians and we multiply by 180 on pi we actually get 30 degrees. So the first uh, sine of x we want to find sine pi on 6 we're actually finding sine of 30 degrees and if I draw a little sample triangle down the bottom I'll try and get about a 30 degree angle. There we go. This is the opposite side, this is the adjacent side and that's the hypotenuse, pi on 6, you can see it's actually going to be pretty small. In fact, sine pi, of, pi on 6 is a half. So I'll mark that in. There we go. Uh, on the unit circle, if we wanted to find sine pi on 6, we draw the line around 30 degrees on the unit circle to a point on the unit circle and drop that line. We can see it's going to be quite small and it's actually around halfway between 0 and 1, which is that value there. 
Now sine pi on 4, where we start the origin on our unit circle and we draw a 45 degree angle up and then we drop a line down to make it a triangle. Sine pi on 4 is going to be larger than sine pi on 6 and it's actually equal to root 2 on 2 or 1 on 2. And we'll mark that in graphically here. And then we've got sine pi on 3. Well, pi on 3 is, about, is, is equal to, pi on 3 radiant is equal to 60 degrees. We'll draw a line from the origin up at 60 degrees to the unit circle and drop the line down, making a triangle. That is equal to root 3 on 2. So I'll write these sine values in. These aren't the angles, these are the actual sine values. Root 3 on 2, root 2 on 2, and I always like to write root 1 on 2 is equal to 1 on 2. So in your head, if you want to know what sine is, you can say starting at 0, it's 1 on 2, root 2 on 2, root 3 on 2, and then up the top, sine of pi on 2 is actually 1, which is, funnily enough, equal to root 4 on 2. So I've always found that a good way of remembering it, but if you can find a better way, go ahead with that. So I'll mark in root 3 on 2 in our graph, and then sine pi on 2 is equal to 1. Now, uh, sine 2 pi on 3 radians, I draw an angle up at, this would be 120 degrees, and you can see the sine value now is actually smaller. It's back down, I draw a dotted line, to root 3 on 2, so we've gone down again. And this is where the curve of sine actually comes from it. It is not increasing, it is not an increasing function, it actually decreases. So without wasting any more time working out these values, I'll just start plotting sine, starting at zero, connecting all these points, maxing out at pi on two, coming down to sine pi is equal to zero, going under to sine three pi on two equals negative one, and then back to two pi. Now, although my graph is a little wonky, there's one feature that I'd like you to pay particular attention to, and that is the gradient of the line as it passes through pi. I'm going to underline, I'm going to circle it, and then get rid of the circle, it's just here. That I often see students draw as a vertical downward. So I'll draw a quick sample uh, sign graph below. This is not right, this is not correct. They say it's a vertical line there and they draw a full semicircle on the top and a full semicircle at the bottom. This indicates that the gradient at this point here is infinite. They say it's vertical. It's not. It's negative one. And we'll see the reason for that in a second. So if you move over to the right hand side of the screen, we'll actually try to take the derivative of sine x, y equals sine x, dy dx is equal to, and before I write this down, let's have a look at the graph and see if we can get an idea of what it is. So the gradient is a max at zero. I'll circle the point where the gradient is, is it a max? And I'll get rid of that circle. Let's mark in, we'll say that gradient is one. It is one, we'll find out in a second. We're just gonna say that's the maximum. Then the gradient gets, if I draw straight lines, you'll see, less steep as it goes along. So the gradient is in fact dropping somewhat. So we can say the gradient is dropping. And then finally on top, it is exactly horizontal, which means the gradient is zero. There we go. Uh, suddenly the gradient becomes negative slightly, so it's a little below the x-axis, and then it becomes more negative, and more negative, and then finally it is, hmm, how do you say, it's almost pointing in the opposite direction to where it started. It is an equal gradient, but in the negative. It has equal magnitude, but it is negative. So we can say that gradient is negative one. And if we start connecting these dots with the red line, it becomes clear that this is, I'll point out it gets less negative here, so it becomes more positive. It starts to go up again. What we're seeing here is the graph Y 
equals cos x. And that is what the derivative of sine x is equal to. So having figured that out, we can start to expand on it. If I had I, the most complicated form of sine x I could have with all the uh, translations and the dilations might be something like this. Y is equal to a sine b x plus c. So when graphing would say a is a dilation in y or from x and b is a dilation from y or in x and c is a translation in x. And then I suppose, gosh, we could have, if we're talking about graphing, we could have a plus d at the end. The derivative of this expression, this relationship, is equal to a, always remains out the front, then it's times b. That's a common theme uh, in derivatives. If there's a coefficient that affects x and it's within the function, whether it be sine x or log x, it usually gets multiplied at the front. Actually, scratch that, in log x, it actually gets cancelled out uh, by the chain rule. Uh, but in the exponential, it would, it would come down as multiple. And then we're still deriving this second part here. I underlined it. And it's cos b x plus c. And of course, d is a constant. So d does not get any derivative. The derivative of d is 0. So that is a b cos b x plus c. There we go. Uh, we'll do a quick example. Let's say we had y is equal to 9 sine 2x plus 5 dy dx is equal to, I'll write down on the side here, a is equal to 9, b is equal to 2, c is equal to 5. So dy dx is equal to a times b times cos b bracket x plus c close bracket. So that's 9 times 2 times cos. And what's inside there does not change. So that's 18 cos 2x plus 5. Uh, looks like I'm going to have to rub this example out, have a good look because it's going to fit in the next one. Gosh, it's a lot like an exercise book here. Um, here's a more difficult one. Y is equal to negative 2 sine 4 bracket 2 take away x. So now we've got a coefficient of negative 1 in front of x. It does not fit the form that I've got just above. Oh, sorry. It does not fit this form. So it's going to be more difficult to derive. First of all, let's get it in that form. This is equal to negative 2 sine 4. I'll put x first, negative x plus 2, which is equal to negative 2 sine. We can change this to negative 4 and divide everything inside the bracket by negative 1. So it's x take 2. And now this is, this is very easy because a is equal to negative 2, b is equal to negative 4, c is equal to negative 2, dy dx is equal to a times b times cos negative 4 x take 2, which is equal to negative 2 times negative 4, that's 8 cos open bracket. Now this is negative 4 times x take away 2. I'm just going to change it back to positive 4 times 2 take away x. There we go.